what we'll cover today is what defines successful volunteer communications? Like what would it be that helps you realize that you have been successful in this endeavor? Um, what are the benefits and challenges of volunteer communications? And we're going to talk about practical tips to create successful practices. So um, stay to the end for all of those. And so first question to consider is what would be the successful outcomes um, that you would see in your program very tangibly from volunteer communications? And how can volunteer managers create successful strategy for volunteer communications? And what tools and practices support that strategy? So we'll go ahead and just kind of start off. Um, I shared this with the group the other day. It's a bit of a, def a working definition. Um, but yeah, volunteer communications. This is a definition that I wrote. So you can write whether or not you agree with it or you'd like to add something, drop that in the chat. Um, but basically, engage volunteers through every stage of their involvement cycle through multiple communication channels. Um, a communication strategy ensures your volunteers know how to participate, feel enthusiastic about volunteering, and understand their impact on your organization and the community. So with that, I'll go ahead and, and tip it over to our panel um, to see what you all have to add and, and share about that. And Melissa, if you want to share a little bit about sort of how you landed in your position and sort of the unfurling of understanding like your own, you know, volunteer communications strategy. Yeah, I um, so I actually started um, my volunteer coordinator position in January, so it's been almost a year. Um, so it's definitely, you know, I'm still learning things every day. But um, I found that communication is really key. Sometimes, you know, I hear like, oh, we're not seeing photos from the events we were at. Um, and that's really important because people want to see, you know, they know we're taking photos. Um, and just kind of listening to people as well, making sure that communication is two ways, that not only are you communicating the impact that they're making, but also listening to their feedback as well. Yeah, I think we chatted a little bit, um, and I'd love, Melissa, if you have some word to share about how your team kind of plays this out, but it's, it's also a, a strategy across all members. So whether it's staff, whether it's an intern, whether it's somebody who is on site, do they know what Melissa wants them to tell the participants if Melissa's not there at that project? You know, how is that communication one removed from her? And then also, you know, I'm sure we'll chat more about this, but how does Melissa get her communications into the director of communications hands to make sure she gets equal voice and weight with other departments and initiatives? So I think there's a, a little bit of a team hierarchy you have to really understand so you know, what am I trying to do? And then, you know, I think, Melissa, if you wanted to share anything about like how you have to work, I believe Victor was his name, and then how you have to work with people who are underneath you that are also out where you can't be. Um, that's a whole strategy element as well. Yeah, so um, so my uh, boss is the community engagement manager. So he does a lot of our social media and communications. But what I've learned is that it's really important to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, that, you know, his social media communications are similar to my communications with the volunteers on like on the events that they're attending and are similar to the communications that the, um, you know, program leads are giving out the people running these specific events. Um, because if, if people, if we don't know what each other are talking about, it kind of seems disconnected and the volunteers might get a little confused or they might think like, hey, what's going on? Um, so it's really important within the organization as well to make sure everybody's kind of on the same page with your messaging. Yeah. I was thinking back um, after we met, we always kind of meet once before your, our actual presentation, so we kind of know what we're doing. Um, but I was thinking after our chat there, my, my first internship was actually with a newspaper. So there is a, a small town, Black Mountain adjacent to Asheville, North Carolina, where a good portion of our Get Connected team is based. And I was just thinking about, and Melissa had shared how, you know, making sure that weighted voice that, you know, the volunteer program is getting exposure, but there's also needs from the fundraising part of the house. There might be needs that are coming out of different areas and different departments. And it really made me think about, you know, 
we would come together as an intern, I get to write one article, but we would come together and the editor would talk through what's going to go on the front page. This, this time it needs to be this emphasis. You know, next time there's an event coming up. So that's going to be the front page. Here's what the topics are. And I'm going to make sure you get one story and you get two stories because the experienced writers can turn out 10 stories. But that allotment of kind of time, I think that's a piece here is communication strategy which departments need more time at certain times of the year, which need less? How do I make sure the headline and the big front page splash on our website and everything else is actually, you know, Melissa's when she needs it because she's about to do her biggest river cleanup versus she can't be there all the time. Um, I love the idea that you were talking about, Melissa, where even your spotlights that you use in the license, they have to rotate because it's an ad. And if it's there and it's stagnant, people don't see it. So how do you think through how you not only support your programs, but also make sure you get time as the organization's support so that you get your percentage of what they're going to focus on? Yeah, so um, it is definitely important. You know, we have a lot of different programs. We have like land management program, education, um, clean river, just all these different types. And so it's really important that you know, we do try and focus if some, you know, if one team needs a little bit more exposure, giving them exposure, but also making sure that maybe a program that's doing really well, they still need exposure too. We don't want to just let them drop off. Um, so yeah, on our Get Connected website, I use those little spotlights and I, I put, you know, our big upcoming events. I especially put events that I'm hoping to get a little more volunteer engagement with. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a little bit of, you know, just it, it, like you said, it's a lot of balancing. Yeah, absolutely. Especially too, when you're thinking about, you know, the front end of that volunteer life cycle, right? So like on that recruitment sort of, a, there has to be some awareness of your organization and what you do before you could really recruit people. And so there's like a piece of what you're doing in your recruitment front end messaging that really has a lot to do with just education and awareness. I really thought it was interesting in doing some research on this, just seeing that there were, you know, like Gen Z and some of the, you know, younger people right now are saying that they're, they're some of the highest likelihood to give time to social action, to social change, to donate, to volunteer, but some, but it looks like from some of the research that they're not always sure how to get involved. And so I think a huge piece of that is like learning how, how does the, how do these different um, sort of generations of people communicate and receive information um, so that we can sort of meet them where they're at and you know, like really considering well, what would successful outcomes for these volunteer communications be? Number one, of course, I think everyone wants to see a boost in volunteer recruitment. That seems like a um, something that I hear a lot of volunteer managers um, talking about. And then also, of course, like volunteer engagement, like just that relationship building that you have with your volunteers. Um, Melissa, I felt like what you were talking about with the photos is actually a form of um it's appreciation, but also communicating impact to the volunteers like afterwards. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the follow-up emails that you use um, that share those? Yeah, so um, so uh, I'll mention we start with what I just call a pre-event email where basically I email everyone who's going to that event and I say, hey, we're so excited to have you. You know, here's where you should park. Please bring, you know, water and wear closed toed shoes, whatever it may be. Um, and then they come to the event. And then when they uh, when I send that email afterwards, I spend a lot of time saying, you know, this is the impact that you made. And we did this because of you and we couldn't have done it without you. And I try and give data if we have it, like um, like 5,000 pounds of trash cleaned up sort of thing, uh, which is something that they do, which is amazing uh, in one event. But um, giving them, you know, or amount of land that we removed invasive plants from um, and showing them those photos and inviting them to another event as well. That's especially a similar event. Um, but yeah, I think really letting them know that you know, not just they showed up and then they never hear from us again, but kind of showing like, hey, we really appreciate what you did and we did it because of you. Yeah, I would imagine that would have um, 
you know, positive impact on just your volunteer retention and in general engagement. Um, but also like really just, I feel like the way that you've broken those communications down, like pre-event, you know, post-event, and then also within the post-event follow-up email, inviting them to the next event is, I mean, that's brilliant. I always wish I had that amount of planning ahead to like have be able to do that, but I, you know, it's incredibly brilliant because I feel like ultimately that's going to just kind of boost like how smoothly your programs are running because I feel like sometimes what happens, at least in my, my personal experience, and maybe some other volunteer managers can speak to this, but like I have, I have had a tendency in the past to feel like I'm often like behind a little bit on my recruitment efforts or my communications efforts to make sure that I've got the right amount of people. Um, I don't know if anyone else feels that way or not, but that's something that I've managed before. So I feel like that always being able to like share that next thing. Um, but how, but how do we get these great layers of communication? And that is the, that's the real challenge. Um, I feel like a lot of, of folks might be running into. Um, Melissa, can you talk a little bit about what your process was like when you first started your position and then sort of as you've grown and developed your process and how you've changed your process? Like what have you implemented that has helped those email, those emails, those layers of communications to your volunteers? Yeah, so when we, um, when I started, it was kind of, you know, I'd get an email in my inbox and someone would say, you know, I'd like to volunteer on this day for this event. And some of the time it's like, perfect, I've got you signed up. But some of the time it's like, that's great. I'm so sorry, but we don't have that event on that day. Can you please clarify? Uh, maybe you meant this or this and then getting their name. And it's like, you know, six emails back and forth and it just takes a lot of time um, and then taking down their information. And so now we have Get Connected, our volunteer management system um, that has really helped us kind of centralize everything and have a way for people to sign up themselves without talking to someone if they don't want to, because some people prefer not to. Um, but also just making all our information in one centralized location where they don't necessarily have to email to get that information, um, where they can find it themselves. And if they want more information, of course, I always love emails, but you know, they don't have to email to say, hey, what is this about? They can read about it themselves on our website. Yeah, absolutely. We were talking, uh, I think Elizabeth, you were here when we were chatting the other day about just like how the email chain can get really long. <laughs> yes. Now we're talking about even internally, just you know, your own team, like you're just trying to get like a time and a date figured out. And it's like, why is this so hard? Like the, the piece of like figuring out how to just, like you said, I think Melissa, and like when we were chatting, you were like, you know, it's two, three emails in before you finally figure out their name and project they're talking about, because they assume, you know, um, and we do that. We, we're in mid thought and we just blast off that information. So having that you know, place you can point them so that it's like 90% of what they need to know is here. And then you're only dealing with that 10% of the communication of clarifying parking or clarifying a question versus having to do that for every single person. Um, I think that's something I've just been really thinking about, even just as we plan for 23, you know, what can I do in mass so that I can automate so much of 80% of the people will understand just based off my email. And then I can really take my time with the 20% that need that intentional touch because they need a one-on-one -on -one conversation to understand what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, I like that. I was curious, Melissa, when you talked about the, um, the communications you plan, and I know, like you said, you, you're just really getting your hands around this program this year, but are you kind of using templates at this point? Do you start your I always feel like it's like mismanners kind of things that I'm so bad at. Like for the people, you know, my baby thank you cards went out probably two years after the fact where I was like, she's two, thank you for your present. Um, but that moment of like, do you start all the post emails before you even had the event? So it's plug and play with pictures. Are you getting to a point where you're moving that direction? Like, how are you managing to, if those are your three touch points, are you doing them as you get to them or is there a little bit of, okay, I can actually reuse that one new images, new title, and I'm good to go. 
Yeah. So I have my, uh, my little like master Google document. Mm -hmm. um, and at the top, it has a template um, for the post event email that basically um, some of it's highlighted because I, I switched that out for the actual relevant text. And it's kind of like talking about impact, giving them the link for the photos, which I upload, you know, I have to do that after the event. And, um, and as well as inviting them to a new event. And so it, it's kind of, um, you know, I, I, I make it sound, you know, it is a template, but I make sure when I send it out that it, everything really fits together. So it does take less time with that template, but I also think it's really important to make sure that it sounds personal to the event. Yeah. Um, yeah. Loaded question, but good answer. I would say, I, I read from you that you were much more organized than <laughs> I, so. <laughs> well, yeah, it kind of seems like any time, you know, anytime you're at working together and you all are having a meeting determining the dates of the events it almost is like when you determine the date and the focus of the event you can just take your like three templates out like this is my recruitment template out this is my template that I'm going to adjust that goes out to everyone who's registered and this is my follow-up template and that way you have that just like pre-planned and it's ready to go um, because I think that's the toughest part is that we know that programming, it's like somebody needs me and I'm distracted and I can get pulled in a few different directions and that being able to like fire off that email um, becomes much more harder. I think when you have to do it from scratch. And so I think actually just like the ease of just creating your own template in advance kind of helps make through, at least for me, the personal mental block of like, of having to do it and just knowing it's kind of part of my post event wrap up and this gets gets fired out so. Um, but here i've got listed some of the common challenges that we hear from the volunteer managers in our network um, collecting complete and accurate volunteer contact information. Um, so that can be tough, you know, especially when we're talking about like how we might be managing an email chain of six to seven emails long and you have to like scan back up to the top to you know, figure out what's going on there and then plug it into where, you know, whatever it is that you're using to um, manage volunteers for your opportunities and events. Um, having communication strategy based on volunteer stages. So like, you know, one of those things I think about like using social media for like outreach and recruitment, but you might not use social media to like tell people what it is they need to bring with them when they're actually signed up. Like you might need to send like a segmented email to those people. So really tailoring the channel that you're using and your strategy of how you're using it to the life cycle stage of the volunteer, right? Um, which I think is great because I love social media a lot, but I recognize that sometimes one-to-one -one or segmented group email conversation is much better. Um, and then just like that time to carry out the broad communication strategy, I am so curious how um, most of us are managing that, uh, that sort of aspect. I think Melissa has really spoken to like just having a plan beforehand. I'd be really interested to hear how, to, how you kind of came to that. Like how many times did it take you before you were like, I need some templates? Um, <laughs> how many events did you go through, I guess, before you were like, I need templates or I need to do follow-up e follow email? <laughs> Yeah, so um, luckily for me, the person who was in this position before me had already made some templates, um, or I, I believe she didn't make templates, but she she would make each pre-event email ahead of time, and I had all that information, so I kind of used that to build my own when I first started, and then over you know the events because we have multiple events a week every week we have a lot going on and so you know over time just figuring out what people are really looking for what's important what's not and tailoring it and then yeah I probably a couple months in is when I was like I think I need a, a copy paste template um, and I also keep all records of every single pre and post event email I've sent out so that if I'm like hey this event was really similar to that other one um, I can go back and look at some of the wording for that past one. That's amazing. So how many tools do you generally use? Because um, I think that's another challenge too. It's like, what tools do you use to carry out these volunteer communications? Like how many things do you feel like you use or did you use and now, now you use? Yeah, so we use a lot of um, the like Google Docs, Google Sheets, all those products, as well as Google Drive so that all our staff can collaborate on things and see each other's documents. 
Um, we, we have uh, this huge Excel sheet for our social media posts that, you know, we can put in posts ahead of time. And then when it comes to the day, they just get posted. Uh, I mean, we do that, but it's, it's ready to go. Um, obviously, we use Get Connected a lot. You know, that really helps being able to just hit a button for everyone at that event and email these users. And now I can send them all an email blast. That's great. Um, I think I saw someone mention Slack in the chat just now. We also use Slack, but um, we do not use that with our volunteers. It's just with our staff and some of our interns are on there as well. Um, so yeah, it's not nothing too complicated and we try not to, you know, you don't want to use too many things because then you're kind of all over the place. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. That's really helpful information for a lot of folks. Um, and then I think also just balancing those simultaneous strategies for the one big time events and then the ongoing communication, like what you're saying is you've got some things that are on repeat probably every week or multiple times a week at different locations. And I think there's a lot of programs in the same situation where they've kind of got this like it's like layers of like these cycles of, you know, communications that are going on simultaneously, especially if you've got, you know, one location with a ton of programming or you have a ton of programming spread across multiple locations, you need to have that like, you know, recruitment, that pre-event email or pre-shift email, even like a shift reminder um, is something that a lot of people send out or feel like if they haven't been able to send it out the times they have sent it out, it's been really effective. So that's one of those things too, is saying, okay, well, what have we sent out that's been really effective and what can we do to increase our capacity to like do the things that we know work? Um, because that sometimes a lot of it is just that time. Um, and capacity for doing it. And then of course, balancing volunteer communication preferences, because I think that, you know, sort of a little bit of the statistic of talking about Gen Z and how they receive information. Um, and some folks are like, well, why won't you just call me? Or, um, you know, why can't we chat in person? Or some people are like, oh, just email me, you know, like everybody sort of wants something different. And then I feel like a lot of times, I'm not sure if you felt this way or not, Melissa, but like, you know, as a volunteer manager, you're wearing so many hats. And um, Elizabeth pointed out the other day, it's like you also become a marketing and communications person as a volunteer manager. Um, so I think that idea of like, I have to balance the different types of communications that people prefer um, and that they receive information best in this way. So that feels like sort of a challenge uh, to the job in general. I'm not sure if anyone else feels that way um, or if you've struggled with balancing that. And um, Melissa, has that been something that you've noticed a lot in your position? Um, yeah, it has been. I think, um, I think to, um, thinking about how, you know, communications work for the volunteers, but also thinking about how it works for our team, because sometimes I'm discussing something with someone um, and it's, you know, like one of those long email chains. And eventually it's like, maybe we should just hop on a call um, and save us both some time. Um, but some people don't prefer to call. They prefer to, you know, to do email. So it is a little bit of a balancing act. Um, I find that email is generally well liked, um, but there are some people that prefer other methods. I was going to, Court, do you remember, I'm sure you remember because you wrote it, but I know one of the sessions that we did earlier this year was on the marketing and what tools to use for which purposes. Um, I'm just thinking there's a lot of chat pieces and we might have that be part of what Nate drops in, um, but we're talking a lot about communication methods. And I just mm -hmm. wanted to point out that part of what that, that webinar was based on was just there's something that's a great tool may be the absolute wrong tool for you to grab for a certain purpose. Um, so thinking about, you know, I've seen Microsoft Teams, Slack, you know, volunteer match for, you know, whatever you're using, you want to think about, and I'm, I'm just going to categorize it, world according to Elizabeth, so bear it, take for the grain of salt. Um, I always think about like, 
a push notification. It's there for an instant. It catches my attention, but I can't count on it for when, you know, Elizabeth the day before wants to go back and make sure I packed my bag with everything I was supposed to bring with me. So that, you know, something that lives in a web page on your, you know, on Get Connected as a content page for, you know, something that's like that in an email, it, it's there. It's very tangible. I can print it out, take it with me. Whereas, you know, Slack, Microsoft Teams for group discussion, Google Docs, we use all these things and you need them for collaboration. The Excel sheet you talked about, Melissa, for making sure all the teams understood what was going to go into social media and what date. Those are good things for that. You know, Slack, any type of AIM kind of old instant messenger feel great for communication, not necessarily great for instructions, because it is a flowing method of communication that's just going by you, kind of like Twitter or Facebook, and finding the conversation where you actually had the detail is hard to find. So that moment of what are the tools you need to facilitate internal communication? What are the tools you need to pull together a group to say, what do we do right? What do we do wrong in this project? Maybe that is a teams-oriented kind of group. And then where do I keep information? So, you know, whether it's on my Get Connected calendar that shows all of the different upcoming events, and they can click into the shift they're going to to read about what they're going to need to do, or whether there's a Google Doc or a web page that goes with your event on however you've shared it, that tangible piece needs to sit there somewhere. So I can go back to it. So I think all these different communication methods and marketing methods and which tool to use for what, um, I think that's always a big question. And I know it's something we've covered here and there along the way. So just wanted to bring that out is that's something that you'll always want to really revisit with each event, each what am I trying to accomplish? So you're thinking through those tools for what's best for this purpose. Hey, that's Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you just continue or anyone who wants to jump in just while we're on that subject? Mm -hmm. um, uh, Karen had a question about training volunteers, you know, flowing method of communication is great, but how about training volunteers? What does that look like and how should that be facilitated? Yep, absolutely. Um, Melissa, you're our guest panelist. Let's take it with you first, if you don't mind taking a shot at it. We can talk a little bit of how we're seeing other clients do it, but I'd um, love to hear how you take someone from a novice to a first timer to somebody that you're going to start to take into a recurring opportunity. Yeah, so some of our events, um, let's see. So for example, some of our trash cleanups, um, you know, somebody might come just for one time and we hope they come more than once, but some programs like our education team, we want those people to be really knowledgeable uh, because we're in, you know, we're, they're working with kids. So we want them to be, you know, someone who does well with that. Um, and so for training, usually we kind of, um, we we actually start with a Google form to get their background and say, hey, like, what is your background working with kids or your background in environmentalism? Um, and they don't necessarily have to have one, but just to get a feel and then having a conversation with them in person or over Zoom and really talking through with them and then and then going through training, whether that's um, you know, right then and there at the event or beforehand. But um, we find that for training, I mean, emailing to set that up is great, but I think the actual training we find is best, you know, not over email, but person to person. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah, I think I think the stages that you talked about is really interesting. We've talked about this in, in some other meetings where I can't necessarily ask somebody to go through all the training to work one-on-one -on -one with a child in their very first experience with your San Diego Foundation. It's something that I need to let them learn a little bit about what we're doing so that they see the value in the program, so that they want to invest their personal time in it kind of taking up their training to the level where now they'll be ready to, to tell you everything about themselves and go through a background check and attend a two-hour session or whatever it might be to train. That's hard for a first touch point. Um, so I think some of our recommendations that we're seeing clients do is they look for something like Melissa's River Cleanup, something that's a very high impact, easy to take part in. Courts talked about Day at the Farm with one of the organizations she supports, where they're just coming in simple. And then once I've kind of met the volunteers and they've had a good experience, you're incorporating into that next touch point. Hey, you, if you liked this, we'd love for you to try this with us. And then I think as Melissa said, that one-on-one -on -one training in person, we're seeing a lot of people move toward those learning management systems where they can watch a video and that 
kind of having watched the instructional video then opens up a private opportunity that they weren't able to do until they could show they had completed some training. Um, so you're able to kind of segment in some of these volunteer management systems like ours, like what you need to lock back and what you can show to the general public based on the training level that they've completed. Yeah, I think what I would add to that is that what we're really seeing is a digital first hybrid landscape. So a lot of times, and Melissa, you can confirm if you're experiencing this. So like you're doing river cleanups and you're doing, you know, hands-on programming. So it's a lot of in-person um, volunteerism. And yet people are learning and connecting digitally. Um, and that is a lot of times their first awareness point, um, their first piece of communication about your organization. Um, some people, I think you said you're still meeting at in-person events and, and then kind of adding them to um, an email list. So it's interesting to see how the in-person and the digital communications streams like really work together, which is why I, I often am, am, I'm kind of repeating myself a lot this last year. And I'm like, it's digital first and hybrid. Like we're still doing things in person. People are still writing down their emails on clipboards. Um, but then we're emailing them to follow up because we're not going to be at another event for another month. Um, and so I think that way of thinking about it, it's not just digital channels and it's not only in person, it's really both of them, which is, I think, a little bit what adds to the layer of complexity of sort of discerning what's going to work for our program and the unique you know, challenges that we face in our program. Um, which is why I kind of put together this list here of like, ultimately, like when, when you're like succeeding by your program's standards of volunteer communication, your volunteers just have like a basic understanding of your organization and they have an understanding of how to get involved with your organization and all of the little pieces that, that, um, that takes place. And Melissa, how would you describe the way that you sort of put these things together in this very hybrid landscape that we find ourselves in? Yeah, so um, we definitely do um, in-person outreach events, um, not as much, you know, and then they're just kind of starting to pick back up again. <laughs> But um, like you said, we get emails on a piece of paper and then you go home and you hope you can read that handwriting and you enter the email and give them the information. Um, and so I, I, find, I, I that find that digital tends to be um, a little bit easier to get a message to a lot of people, but you also have to be you know, when you're in person, you can hear the tone of someone's voice. You can hear if I'm super excited and pumping you up. Um, but digitally, you just have to make sure that you're still getting your point across. You're still getting that excitement up and still conveying your message. Um, and it's not just a boring email with too many words. That's yeah. a little bit about that feedback too. Um, I think Court was sharing how she had to carry some tables a very long distance across a very large field because she parked on the wrong side of the field. And Melissa was saying, you know, even dropping pins so that people can know what part of the river are they actually supposed to be at. Um, I do think in this hybrid world, I just put out the, the caution and kind of note to everyone listening, it's so critical to have that in-person feedback loop to hear from the people there that are like, whoa, I parked on the wrong side of the field. And that moment of a coordinator's mind has to be like, ooh, I did not give enough instruction on which side of the field if they're carrying tables. But that moment of like, I don't know if you, all the rest of you, I catch it the next time because the next time I still haven't fixed it and I hear the complaint again. And that time it lodges in my brain that I'm like, I've done this twice in a row now. I've got to fix this communication method. Um, but I think just that point of right after the event, when it's fresh in everybody's mind, whether it's staff, hey, did you guys hear anything? Thing that you're like, oh, we need to tweak this for next time. If it's volunteers just circulating amongst them to be like anything that you noted, that is critical to then make the virtual instructions next time, make the things that you're going to put in a bold sentence at the top, just have that little tweak so that you're constantly improving, even if it's just a small thing so that everyone has a good experience day of. 
Yeah, I um, I find that actually being at the events is so crucial. And, you know, also sometimes there are staff members and you ask staff members, hey, what didn't go perfectly well? Um, and they may not remember or they may, you know, it may not mean a lot to them, but it's something that I can perhaps work on. Um, so just being there in person and also meeting the volunteers. And, you know, sometimes I, you know, they're like, oh, my name is John. And I'm like, John Smith, I saw your sign up. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's me. Um, so actually meeting these volunteers as well is great. So I love being in person out in the field. That's amazing. I um, So I feel like it's kind of, it's like, I don't know if anyone else has felt this way or if you felt this way, Melissa, but finding this right formula of like, what do I do with all of these layers of communication um, different tools, different mediums, like photos, videos, graphic. Do I need graphics? Do I need to do handwriting? It's like, this is a lot of variables that volunteer managers are dealing with on a daily basis. And you're sometimes shifting gears. I don't even know how many times a day. Um, but when you think about it, this is a lot of variation and nuance as to like, you know, what works and how do we implement it? Um, do you feel like that's a formula that you, um, that you have figured out or that you're kind of always evolving and that you're dialing in in some places, but maybe you have other, you know, space with room to grow because it's a lot of complexity when I really started to list this out, you know, people who want to see photos, but not that much writing, people who prefer a video, people who want to be in person, it's kind of a lot. Yeah, I think um, I think it is a lot. I think it's something that I'm kind of always learning. And another thing is, you know, we um, were in a little bit of a different time now. We had a pandemic, and a lot of people didn't want to volunteer. And now, at least our organization, we're seeing it, our numbers pick back up again. Um, and as more people get involved, things have to shift. Um, you know, now I have to communicate to more people. And now, you know, maybe the preference the general preference has shifted. So I think it's something that's always changing and always learning. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's part of why, A, this is so important because we know it has so many benefits for the volunteer program, for the volunteer experience, you know, because I can't tell you how many things I've shown up to and been like, I don't know what's going on, or I've been the volunteer at an event and other people have said, Hey, what's going on? And I'm like, I don't know, you know, so, but usually if you have a smile on your face, you can make it through that. But I still feel like, um, it's kind of this thing that we're always sort of grappling, grappling with because it, it is an evolving sort of conversation. And so what worked 2019 maybe doesn't work anymore. And, and it's changed a little bit. And I think that, um, you know, some of the, the consumer research, you know, the economic consumer research has said that people need to be, to be exposed to a message more times than they did a couple of years ago um, to be able to receive that message. Um, so one of the things I always say when chatting with volunteer managers, if they're worried about bothering people or posting too much or sending too much communication, um, I usually tell people that the people worried about that aren't the people doing it. <laughs> like you're probably not sending too much um, if you feel concerned about it. Um, usually people say thank you if you send them like that third reminder email and they like still hadn't finished their form and you finally remind them again and they're like, oh, thank you because they have so many emails, you know? So um, I, I'd, I'd be curious, you know, how to volunteer, how are you dealing with maybe people not responding? to communications? Like, what does that feel like? Yeah, um, it's, it's definitely a little bit tough. Um, and we, um, we actually don't have as much for most of our events where we need as much communication from them other than, you know, I let them know like, hey, if you're not going to attend, or you need something, please let me know. Um, but I, I think that, um, Sorry, little little brain thing there. Um, I think it is um, something that is a little bit difficult to deal with. Yeah, for sure. Um, sometimes too, I've talked to folks and I'm just like, change the subject line of the email 
um, and make the subject line a little bit more personal. And it it's actually really helpful because a lot of times people, if the subject line doesn't feel like it's exactly about them, they just won't open it. They'll think it's an, an email from the organization that doesn't have to do with them. But if you make it really personal, like, you know, see you this Saturday, it reminds them like, oh, I signed up for this thing this Saturday, as opposed to like river cleanup, you know, it's like, see you at the river cleanup on Saturday is kind of just that little shift that maybe will increase your volunteer engagement in, in your communications because they actually realized it was something that pertained to them. Um, so, and, and I just want everyone to know that I'm going to send out the recording all the slides um, from our presentation today, as well as a bonus guide, um, some fun worksheets that I created for everyone. So all of that's going to go out on Monday. Um, but I want to just talk about like, these are some of the things that we talked about today. We'll just go over these real quickly and hopefully spend the last few minutes maybe um, asking some questions and having some conversation from the chat. But um, just like a little take action note, you know, all of us, we can always learn, I think if you just learn one thing or take one thing away um, that helps you with your communication strategy, um, that is always really useful. So just kind of creating that regular interval to like regularly evaluate, like, do we have all of the necessary like layers of communication planned out or like recognizing like, oh, here's a place where we could create some templates and make our lives a little bit easier. Um, I think also to, you know, identifying where your strongest results are. Because when you know what is working and saying like, hey, this right here is really working, then you can like send more energy to that and um, and really boost it. Um, because spending your time boosting something that's already working is, is going to help you out a lot. And then also determining like what new communication channels, processes, or possibly tools would help you sort of you know, um, one of the things that Melissa said that really stuck out to me was like, they try to keep it as simple as possible. They've got, you know, this one place that everybody is unifying their social media together. They've got one place where volunteers are looking at opportunities, registering and, you know, signing up through their Get Connected site. They've got, you know, the Google Dots that they're doing for their internal stuff. So it's like, don't don't use too many tools. And I think that sometimes I have gotten caught up in the, I need another tool thing. And I've had six, seven tools and I'm trying to make them all work together um, and mostly just made my life more challenging. So if anyone has been been there, I, I too have spent a lot of time there. Um, so let's take some time here at the end and uh, just spend the next couple of minutes. What questions, you know, are popping up? Nate, do you want to throw Before us any we, questions? I was going to say, Nate, um, let's maybe point out the Q&A place, because I think that'd be a place that everybody can start dropping some of the ones they want to pose now, as well as some yeah. of the ones he's got. Um, one thing I did want to say just before you moved off the last slide, and I thought you had a really cool bullet point on there, Court, if you don't mind going back just a second. This when? happened, yeah. This happened yesterday, and I just wanted to share it because I thought it was so powerful. Because we started saying your your outcome, your outcome is really what what you got to focus on. And one of the things that um, it was a site tour where someone who was new with a license was kind of taking over you know, as Melissa took over someone else's kind of work and seeing what what could be improved and what was working. And I thought it was really interesting. It's a really strong client site. They had you know two three thousand volunteers registered in the last five hundred. 500 people had responded to an opportunity to serve in the last six months, and they had 30 people that had recorded hours. So I sat there and I was listening because th there's those moments of like, what is the goal and the outcome? If hours wasn't important to them and they have, you know, two, 3,000 people signed up and they want more than 500 responses, then they're going to have to think about a communication strategy to say, why are these 500 signing up and the other, you know, 1500 are not, what can I do here? What can I communicate? What can I advertise? It's a lot of advertising. How do I change a picture as some of the people suggest in the chat, have a better title. That could be the outcome goal if that's important. But I was just thinking, listening today, you know, theirs was actually, they needed to win some grants. So the hours recorded was their bigger problem. They have 500 people responding. They don't have any hours being recorded. So, you know, part of what we were talking with them about was if that's your goal, I've got to record the hours, then your communication strategy is reaching out to those 30 people who recorded their hours to be like, 
how did you record them? What reminded you to record them? Where did you record them? Why is this working for these people and it's not working for the rest of our membership? So that moment of just thinking through what's important, what's your outcome? Because where you, as Court said, you could have seven different tools, but if three of them are going to get better reporting and four of them are going to get better engagement and recruitment, which one do I really need? Which one is my program going to be measured on? And that's where I'm going to put my emphasis, my time, my resources. Okay. You may now move to the next slide. Thank you, Courtney. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> a great I, was, I really wanted to share it after it was so relevant yesterday. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, because you're going to be in different, you know, different place in your program and what you've got to focus on, you know. So every, every program is different in that. And it might be different beginning a year to the end of the year you know. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got a couple questions. Um, one of which, Jody, you can feel free to clarify to me if we don't answer this in the right way, but great question. She's coming to us from a small nonprofit, very small. What's the most important strategy to adopt? And it may relate to what Elizabeth was just saying with goals, but go ahead and take that away. <laughs> Take yeah, take on I, think, it and, okay, yeah. I was going to say, I do think it has to do with, with your goals. So if, if you're at, um, I remember at one of the community webinars we had, um, a few months ago, you know, they were having a really hard time getting volunteers. And so they just, their, their communication strategy really needed to focus on, recruitment and then engagement, like keeping the, like recruiting those volunteers and then keeping them engaged. That was just where they seem to be at in their program growth. In fact, this may have actually been at the volunteer recruitment webinar we did a few months ago. And some folks in the chat had some really great ideas for how this, you know, smaller nonprofit and their community in a, in a smaller town could really engage a core group of people. And so I think a, a lot of it does have to do with what what your goals are, um, you know, maybe it's retention and, re and repeat, repeat volunteerism. So you're going to focus on more of an engagement strategy, um, and then learn what works with those folks, which I, I think too, sometimes you can just ask them, do you like, do you open my emails? You know, like, do you see my emails? Um, and if, if they're like, oh, you've been emailing me, you know, or maybe you learn that you actually don't have accurate email addresses or, or something like that. So it could sometimes be a simple solution. Um, it's just a matter of kind of finding a way to have that conversation. Melissa, did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think also what's really important is um, is is focusing on your tool set because I've found that, you know, Galaxy Digital is a really great tool that I use and it has freed up my time to now focus on other things. And so really uh, making your systems run smoothly instead of like putting out fires all the time um, really gives me the time to now, it's like, okay, well now I have the time to focus on something that I didn't before. Um, so I think, you know, and I also think asking the volunteers themselves, you know, I'm a fan of just even making a Google form and sending it out and just, you know, hey, will you, you know, will you please fill this out? I want to hear from you. I want to hear, you know, if you loved the event, I want to hear why. If you hated the event, I truly hope you did not. But if you did, why? Um, so I think just asking for that feedback because they're the ones, you know, that this program is about. They're the ones out there. Mm -hmm. And the other, the other thing ahead. is, I think I'm trying to remember which <laughs> we've done so many of these this year. It's been great. Um, courts kept our topics moving. And so we, we've addressed a lot of different things. So I would invite you, I think if you're going back to our website, it's backslash or forward slash, it's a slash. I think it's that way, that way, if I'm mirrored, <laughs> um, it says blog on the website, but that learning resource center has a lot of really good information that Nate's been dropping into the chat for us. Um, I was going to say, if you're small, one of the strategies we talked about was finding another nonprofit to align yourself with. And it doesn't have to be, I'm a small food pantry, so I'm going to align with a large food bank. It can be complementary services. Um, this actually may have come out of America's Service Commission that we were doing a presentation for, but it was... Um, 
it was the example given um, Eleanor from our team was talking about how a animal rescue was partnering with a senior center. So they were bringing pets into the senior center and it helped them exercise and facilitate and re, you know, with the animals, but it also let the people in the senior center have that engagement and touch that they needed. So it was interesting, I think sometimes as a small nonprofit, just to think about who you can align with, that maybe then you'll have shared resources, shared media channels, shared staff, because you can work together on some big events. If your causes are complementary and people who care about that are going to easily see it joined together, I think that one's really important. Um, I'll let Melissa, this next question coming out is about email. How do you get around that? If they say no email, no text, my immediate thought was you have to almost challenge it with a line that says, you know, if you select no email, no text, how would you like to receive your reminders? Um, that moment of like, they need to understand what they're turning off. I think that's a little bit of, of what we, in today's age, we ask the question and we don't really understand why did they say no email, no text? They're afraid of getting something 20 times. Do you want a reminder of your upcoming shifts? That might be something they're going to say yes to all the time. So do you find you have to call them or navigate that, Melissa, or how, how have you kind of taken that, that challenge? Can we, sorry to interrupt, can we also add the lens of, hey, there, there are so many different demographics. Yes. Sometimes our elder folks don't want to communicate like that, or our younger generation doesn't do email. I don't do it. Yep. So with that lens, floor is yours. <laughs> yeah, so um, we... When um, volunteers sign up with us, we um, do get their email address. And to be honest, we don't really, you know, we don't really give them, ask them whether they would not like to give us that. Sometimes people come to us and they're like, hey, I don't want to give that out. And, um, you know, we've had some volunteers that make like a separate email account that, you know, is just for us because um, that's what they prefer. But it's kind of, it's also about, you know, we're also a smaller organization. We've got, I think right now it's 15 staff members. It's just, you know, bigger for us, you know, we kind of the biggest we've been in a little bit. But um, I think at a certain point, you know, it, it is very important to communicate the way the volunteers can want to communicate. But I think at a certain point, it's also important to be able to communicate in the way that's going to work for you and your organization and not take your entire day you know, catering to every different thing. And so it's, you know, it's also about making people understand like why this email is so important. Yeah. I think the why, Melissa, like if you get a chance to talk to them, you know, through volunteer onboarding, volunteer training, and in one of the things that you shared with us earlier in the week is that you always put a why. And so I think that idea of not just always putting the why like in the email, but also telling them why this is important, you know, and even just saying like, we're a really small staff. We really want to meet people where they're at. This is the, this is the best way that we can like leverage our time to be able to, to, and then focus on the cause. Because, you know, then it's like, you know, we've all got to do this work together for the cause. That's that's just, um, you know, sort of another way of sort of bringing it back around of why are we all here and why are we all doing what we're doing, you know? Um, and sometimes you you do kind of just have to ask, like, help me help you. Like, let, how can we, like, where I'm not going to be putting myself in a position as a volunteer coordinator that I'm overextended and unable to get this done. Um, but also like, I'm understanding your, your need for this, but we've got to meet some somewhere. And that's really what communication is all about. We've got like two more minutes before we have to say bye, because Melissa has got to go. Um, it's a busy day in San Diego. <laughs> so maybe we have time over one more question. And then Nate, if you could take note of, of any additional questions that didn't get answered, if you could kind of copy paste those and we can follow up with folks. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think last one, a lot of them had to deal with that kind of grouped in, hey, how do we address the different demographics and how they want to communicate, which is great. Um, last one just came in from Sharon, um, coordinator, volunteer coordinator at a, a crisis center. I often recruit at events, tend to get a lot of interest from people at the event, but very few follow through afterwards. Any suggestions or strategies that she can use to help with the follow-up? kind of touched on this earlier. I know Melissa did, but feel free to take it away. 
Um, yeah, I think part of what's really important is that um, if someone comes to an event, letting them know like the impact that they made because that makes them more likely to want to come back. Um, and it makes them really excited about what they did and about doing it again. Um, but I think it is definitely difficult um, and something that's a little bit challenging to, to kind of figure out. Yeah, I feel like that energy. Too. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say some of the things we've seen too is that like if the next step is is a step too far, challenge that. But if they're interested in the cause and they're saying that and expressing that at the event, then I think you know having a list of options with you to say like are any of these ones that you would want to do, then you're being very tangible of yes, I'd like to do that or no, I wouldn't want to do that. And then date and time, play with that some because if you're they're interested, but the only river cleanup is on a Monday at noon, Sorry, I'm never going to get to attend. Whereas somebody who is coming in at after hours or weekends, suddenly Elizabeth's family can participate. So do challenge a little bit your internal rhythm and. Um, um, and I think that's that's helpful, just opening up maybe access points that you thought no one wanted to do the thing when really they just couldn't do it Monday at noon. Yeah, maybe too, like when you get their information, having them check different things that they're interested in, as opposed to just my organization now has your information, maybe like more specifics about the programming could help uh, with follow up because then you're like, hey, you were interested in our clothing closet and you just talked to them about that one thing that they checked and not the whole program. Um, so we do have to go. We're at the top of the hour and we've got to say goodbye. And thank you so much to Melissa Montoya. You can check out what San Diego River Park Foundation is doing at sandiegoriver.org. And you can also see Melissa's Get Connected volunteer site at sandiegoriver.galaxydigital.com. And um, to join us for the next webinar that we're having in December, um, make sure to keep in touch with us by joining our Volunteer Management Insider publication at galaxydigital.com. And uh, if you have questions about Get Connected, you can reach right out to us at info at galaxydigital.com. And we want to thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your time, Melissa, um, and for your insights and just sharing everything that you're doing in San Diego um, to keep the river clean. And um, thanks to Elizabeth and to Nate for manning the chat. And thank you to everyone for attending today. I'm really grateful that we could all be together and talk about this. Please look for an email follow-up from me on Monday. All right. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Bye, everybody.